On today's show, the former Navy SEAL and current business consultant and best-selling author, Mark Devine shares with you how to build an elite team without having elite players to start with, how to learn to become an action-oriented person, how to learn to become a more self-disciplined person, why action kills doubt, how he went from being a certified public accountant to becoming a Navy SEAL and a leadership expert, and the importance of mentally preparing to face each and every day. If you are looking for practical tips, strategies, and techniques to win the mental battle you need to be a successful entrepreneur each and every day, then this is the show for you. If you're trying to learn how to overcome fear, then this is the show for you. If you want to become a more self-disciplined person, then this is the show for you. Some shows don't need a celebrity narrator to introduce the show, but this show does. Two men, eight kids, co-created by two different women, 13 multi-million dollar businesses. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Thrive Time Show. Thrive Nation, as you know, I am passionate about the men and women that serve our great country who create freedom because without you folks out there, uh, my first business, DJConnection.com, I was a disc jockey. It, it, it turns out to be, it's hard to be a disc jockey in North Korea. It turns out it's hard to be a disc jockey who makes millions of dollars in the Soviet Union. It turns out it's hard to have a successful business when you're worried about your safety. So on today's show, we have a man who once served as a Navy seal and so if you're listening right now in your vehicle i think a little clapping is in order there mike divine welcome on to the thrive time show sir how are you <laughs> man i'm doing well thanks so much to have me i appreciate that thing. um i i don't know if you remember uh that time when you were in the seals but was it hard <laughs> uh <laughs> you know there there were times that were really really challenging but overall it was um you know an incredible incredible time how, so, um, how so, old were you when you figured out that you wanted to be a SEAL? Like, how old were you? You know, I was a little bit of a late bloomer. I um, didn't even know about the SEALs until my early 20s. And I went through SEAL training uh, 25. I turned 26 in SEAL training. Now, you got to remember, you know, I, I was, this is the 1980s, and there wasn't a whole lot of information. The SEALs truly were you know, a secret organization back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. They didn't really start opening up. It was the internet that kind of cracked them wide open and network TV. But there wasn't any shows. There were only a couple of books uh, written by a couple of Vietnam vets. And so I didn't really know about the SEALs. And, um, you know, I had to kind of ferret it out myself. So and, you, did you, get, did you get recruited? Did you hear about it through a friend? Or did you remember the moment you thought, you know what, I want to become a SEAL? <laughs> well, part of my story that I, um, you know, that I, that I write about actually in my, in this book, I tell a little bit in the, in the book that I just released called Staring Down the Wolf was that I was, um, my first career was in business. I was a certified public accountant hmm. and, um, I was, I was hired to out of a small liberal arts school called Colgate University. I'm from upstate New York and I was an athlete and, you know, I was hired at Colgate was basically all swimming and triathlons and, and a little bit of academics and beer and women kind of thrown in, not all in that order necessarily. Mm. And then I got hired to um, go to NYU Business School and become a certified public accountant by, you know, Cooper's Library, which is now a place where I have Cooper's. So all of this, you know, is in my, you know, college years and then in my first four years in the workforce, there was, you know, it was all business for me. And uh, I came from a business family from upstate New York, and they kind of, ex they thought this was just the best thing since sliced bread that I was going to get an MBA from a top business school. I was going to become a certified public accountant, get some great work experience. Then I could come home and assume the mantle at the family business. That was my programming. And what disrupted my programming and, and really got me thinking a different way and totally changed the paradigm, uh, changed everything for me was Zen meditation. So I know it's like, it's, it's an unusual story, but what happened is I started a martial arts program shortly after going down to New York. And it turns out that the ma martial arts master was also a Zen master. And he, 
his actually um, preference was to teach Zen through, through his martial arts, but he had a small cadre of us who really took to the Zen. And so we trained um, every day for 20 minutes. We committed to 20 minutes every, day, every morning. And then we did long hour long sits on Thursday nights. And then we would go to the Zen Mountain Monastery in Woodstock, New York for long weekend sits with the Zen monks. And, um, you know, we didn't really know what was going to happen, right? We were just exploring and it, it was a pretty cool thing for me as a warrior to be thinking, I'm going to, I'm going to be like the Zen master, you know, who's sitting on his bench and can explode into action like a samurai. And what happened to me was that it, it literally changed the way my brain worked. Right? I started to have a lot more intuition, a lot more insight mm. and a lot more, um, you know, I just slowed down a bit and I began to ask better questions and, that's when I started to get this sensation and this feeling and kind of this knowingness that you could say was coming from my, you know, maybe my spiritual center or whatever you want to call that, that basically said, Mark, you're, you're misfit as a CPA. You're meant to be a warrior. You know, you need to go off and do warrior, warriorly things and lead people in, you know, those gnarly situations. You know, the suit and tie is not your, it's not your world. And it wasn't until that, until I started to get that, um, those insights, which happened literally after about a year and a half to two years of meditating that I learned of the seals, you know, when I was ready, they kind of revealed themselves to me. So no, that was a long winded answer way of saying I was not recruited. I literally discovered it or uncovered it through this process. What was the most challenging first thing that you ran into in the seals? What was like the one thing you ran into right away where you're like, uh Oh, uh Oh, or I'm not, maybe, maybe I missed my calling. Maybe I should go back and be a CPA. A CPA. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, ironically, I, I had a blast in SEAL training. Really? You don't hear a lot of guys saying that. I, I went to SEAL class 170, but we call it BUDS, basic underwater demolition SEAL training. 185 hardcore guys. Um, they didn't let any women in back then, but they since opened it up to women and so no, none have um, completed the training yet. So, but then it was all men and, um, you know, pretty hardcore. And so I showed up at 185. We graduated 19 guys and I was the honor man or number one graduate in my class. Wow. And yes, I, I was physically fit for sure. You know, I did what I needed to do to be prepared physically, but I'm 100% convinced that it was the Zen training that made field training um, really easy and fun for me. I'm not saying it was, let me just say it was easy compared to the challenge a lot of other peers were having. So I didn't have one of those off moments or like, I don't think, you know, I'm in the right place. I want to go back to field training. In fact, the very first day of training, you know, very first day, uh, you know, we had like this four hour colossal beat down mm. and this is on the beaches of Coronado in San Diego and just, total insanity chaos all the instructors are just really trying to get under everyone's skin to see how many people they can get get to quit on the first evolution of the first day and there was this guy that i had been training with for about six months four of that you know four plus change at um officer candidate school in preparation to go you know become an officer and then to go to buzz after that and this guy like literally on a warm day he could run circles around me and he could do more push-ups more sit-ups the only thing I could really beat him in was a swim because I was a competitive swimmer. And on this very first evolution, I can remember getting halfway through it and, and looking up and uh, down the beach and the sun is out. And it's like, here I am in San Diego, California on the beach. And I'm literally getting paid to work out. And I've got all these really ridiculously funny. This is my thinking, right? These ridiculously funny seal instructors who are all now my idols around me, you know, beating me up and I'm just absolutely having a ball. And at the same time, people are quitting like flies. And my buddy, this guy, Bill, that I'd been training with for yeah. six months and he was like been wanting to be a seal for years. As soon as, you know, the instructor said, okay, class hit the surf again. And this is like this 20th time we've been in and out of that cold ocean. He turns and hightails it toward the bell, which is basically, you know, if you want to quit, you go to, Ring the bell. Ring the bell. And he hightails it. Yeah, you ring the bell. And he's, he- he's heading toward this bell. And I turn and I'm like, Bill, come back. And I start running after him. And, the, and one of the monster instructors just literally 
put his body between me and Bill and looked at me in the eye and said, Mark, this one's on him. You get back to training. So I turned around and went back to training and I heard that bell ring a few moments later. Hmm. And I remember that struck me. I was like, wow, like this is not about physical. This is like this seal training has nothing to do with the physical. Once you get here, that's just a prerequisite. It's all about the mental and the emotional. And in this case, it wasn't even mental. It was pure emotional. Like he literally forgot why he was there, what this pain was about. And he had an emotional reaction. And in that moment, he was like, I'm done. I'll quit. You know, and I saw that time and again in that training and throughout the years, like, you know, there's a reason that 85% of people fail and it's not the physical. It's because there's this mental and emotional pattern that they have that when the instructors or when the moment finds you and you're, and exposes that weakness underneath, then, you know, the reaction is to, to cower is to run away from that. And so they quit or they get injured. And we call it a quinjury. A lot of the injuries are actually quits that are disguised as injuries. It's really interesting, actually. I want somebody to, uh, we have so much ground you covered, and I want to go back and kind of unpack some stuff. You said that these people are quit, injury, quinjury. Um, and you said what percentage of people quit SEALs? 85% don't make it through training from the start of BUDS. It's actually a much higher percentage if you consider the, you know, the first time they raise their hand to go to boot camp, and then and some don't make it through boot camp, and then there's a program called Buds Preparation, and that's another four months. Then I think only 40 or 50 percent make it through that, and then once you start at Buds, 85 percent quit or get yep. injured, and 15 percent make it. And I want to make Those sure the, the listeners so pretty. I want to make sure the listeners hear this, Mark, because we have you know close to two thousand shows we've we've recorded, and, and our longtime listeners know this, know this. And Josh Wilson with Living Water, you you know this too. But according to the SBA, the Small Business Administration, approximately eighty five percent of business owners quit. One could call it a quinjury. Uh, Inc. Magazine says ninety six percent of people stop they they quit with their business within a decade. I have found that the people who are the most successful are the most able to sit down. You use the word meditate. Um, some might say thought, thinking, contemplation, pondering, maybe reflection, rumination, concentration. But I have found the most successful people on a daily basis sit still for about an hour a day. I call it my hour of power. But I sit down. Mm -hmm. And you right, you think about, you know, what are my goals for my faith, my family, my finances, my fitness, my friendship, my fun? What are my goals? And, and was yesterday a good day? Was I doing a good job? Was I, did I not? Where could I have improved? Mm -hmm. And we have all these thoughts and we think. For me, I like to do this around 3 in the morning. I think before anybody calls me, before the text messages, before, and it's, certainly it's not war, it wasn't battle, nothing great like what you did, but I used to book... 4,000 weddings a year. And so the mothers of the bride would start oh, calling, yeah. 80 of them every weekend, calling, wanting to change the songs, wanting to reschedule, wanting to move the time around. The, the bride would call, wanting to change the colors of the wedding party or the, the, the lighting of the event or wanting to expand the dance floor or contract it. Or And if you're a business owner, the war starts, and I hate to use the word war because you actually, th there's a reverence for that term, but the, 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 the battle starts or the drama okay. starts as soon as you make contact with the, the office, with the team. But so many people, when they hear the word meditation, because we have a lot of Christian listeners, and I'm a Christian listener, I'm a Christian host, but a lot of them go, oh, oh I can't do it, I can't, I can't. Meditation, it's a weird show, weird show, I, I'm out. So when you're meditating, I want to take the religious aspects out of it. Because I know Craig Groeschel, yeah. the pastor of Life Church, biggest church in America, talks about taking time to contemplate, to marinate, to ruminate. Um, and to have a conversation with yourself, nobody else. What does it mean to you to, to, to meditate? Yeah, I agree with you. Meditation as a word has been corrupted. It's loaded. People bring all sorts of meaning to it that is not accurate. To me, it's just, it, it, it's a catch-all phrase, almost like the word leadership that could mean a lot of different things. And so when I teach this, um, when I teach in my Unveil Mind program meditation, I, I actually break it down and 
and don't usually often use that word until I'm well into it. And then I say, okay, this is basically, these can be considered meditative practices, which really is a word that comes from Eastern traditions. And those Eastern traditions are practices or not. They also are included in uh, religious and spiritual traditions, where, which is where, you know, let's say a Christian might think, oh, well, that's a Buddhist practice. So if I do that, it makes me a Buddhist or it's in conflict with my Christian beliefs. And that's not true because the, the, it's just a simply a practice for developing your mind. So um, meditation is any internal practice that's going to help develop the quality of your thinking and the quality of how you use your mind. Now, there are a lot of different ways that we use our mind, and you already mentioned a few. One is just flat-out obsessive-compulsive reactionary behavior, and that's what's called the default mode. And every, most people, you know, who don't uh, sit down and begin to curate the quality and the quantity and the directionality of their thinking, essentially improve their thinking or thinking about their thinking, then they're in default mode and, and they're literally, you know, neuroscience will say that we have 60,000 thoughts a day and 85, there's that number again, 85% of them are the same thoughts we had yesterday and we're five times as likely to have negative mental processing as we are positive. And that's just the way the brain is wired. They call that the negativity bias. So if you're operating on a five times negativity bias with, you know, 45,000 thoughts that are obsessive, compulsive, yes. negative, and the same as yesterday, it's no wonder, you know, you have these weak results. Or especially if the thoughts are like, I can't do this, or I'm not worthy, or I'm not good enough, or I'm not as good as that entrepreneur, yep. then eventually that's just going to grind you into the ground. So, you know, meditation is basically putting a halt to all of that mm. and then beginning a process of learning how to really control the quality of your thinking. So I'll keep, I'll keep this short because I'm probably... No, this is great. This, no, 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 this is... This is of other questions, but... This is great. But here's, here's the thing, Clay. You've got to start somewhere. Most people jump into the deep end of the pool when it comes to meditation and they... They learn, and this has happened to me when I started Zen training, you learn that it's really, really hard to, to override those 60,000 thoughts that have gotten really comfortable. Those, yes. those loops and ruts are like rivers in your brain. They just, you know, they're really hard to interrupt that. So what we do is we teach a practice of breath control, and that we double that as a concentration. It's like a stacked practice. So we say you're going to focus just on breathing in this pattern. The pattern is a box where you're going to inhale the four count, hold your breath for four count, exhale for four count, hold your breath for four count, and do nothing but focus on that. And what that does is it de-stresses your body. It gets you um, gets your brain really calm. And now because you're just focusing on that one thing, you're able to deepen your powers of concentration. So that that's really the, the one, two, the first two steps of any type of meditative practice is to, rebalance and de-stress your body and your brain is part of your body then to concentrate your mind to have your mind become more able to focus on the right thing one thing which is the right thing hopefully for longer and longer periods of time these two skills right there are money for entrepreneurs and and frankly they come naturally to a lot of entrepreneurs because we've learned to focus you know on our mission you know, almost to the exclusion of a lot of other things, you know, sometimes not good, right? Because you can get really unbalanced that way. And um, so box breathing de-stresses your body. It gets you into that parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest and digest, counteracting all the stress that's been building up and all the stress you might take on in the day. Mm. And then concentrating that mind. So you can focus like a laser beam on the right things at the right time. And, you know, you hopefully have chosen wisely there. So those are the first two steps to teach any type of meditative practices. And then, you know, from there, you're going to open up more into the mindful awareness, which is to look at the patterns of your thinking. This is where we get into metacognition, thinking about the quality of our thinking. And that's where, you know, when you talk about rumination and contemplation, yep. it's really effective to be able to contemplate when your mind can concentrate and is mindfully aware of its patterns that can pull you out so that you're not ruminating or contemplating on things that you shouldn't be or negative things or, you know, obsessive compulsive things. 
You know, I'm, I'm going to so, keep you long today, Mark, because I want, I want to dive into your book. I want to keep you long, but we don't have a lot of guests that will go here with me, so I'm going to go there, and I'm just going to keep going there, and I'm sure Josh has questions for you too. But um, what I do, and I just want to make sure all the, the listeners know, I'm not saying this is what you need to do. I'm just saying this is what right. I do. I get up, I write out my list, I take out a pen, and I write down my goals for my faith, my family, my finances, my fitness, my friendship, and my fun, my F6 and I ask myself, did I get better on that or worse? And what could I have done better? What do I need to do today to get closer to? Because I want to have traction, not distraction. And then I begin to make my to-do list after I've relaxed and calmed my brain. There's been no distractions. And so I'm going to read off to you, and we'll try not to get super panic attacks as we, as we read off my to-do list here. Is that, does that sound fair, Mark? This is what I made this morning. Because um, I knew we'd be <laughs> talking about this at some point. So, um one of my uh, companies, it's a real estate company, recently we had a person who wanted to buy a house, and as you know, you have to have credit to buy a house. And at the 11th hour, at the last hour, they, they said, we, we can't close today. We, we, we don't have funding. So then they rescheduled another time to close, okay? And they said, we can't close. we got to reschedule. We don't have funding. This happens four times over a period of four months. So my seller says, you know what I need to do? I need to just tell them I'm not going to work with them anymore. I'm going to sell to somebody else. And because they felt like Good. there was a bait and switch there, Mark, they filed for mediation. And I lost <laughs> the mediation. So I lost $1,000. Oh, down arrow. down That right there was a down arrow. So I wrote on my list, wrote on my list, uh, write a check. Oh, there it is. So it's on my list right here. Then a guy by the name of Augustino Andrew, a blast from my past, a coffee shop. Oh, yeah. Sent me an encouraging message, and he wanted to know about what equipment he needs to make a, a radio show and a video show. Mm -hmm. So that was, I wrote that down. Then Dr. Whitlock, a great cosmetic surgeon, says, I'm booked out, Clay, four plus weeks now. And I thought to myself, holy, holy cow. And then Corey Minner says, I can't find my podcast, baby. I gave him my podcast, baby. I can't find it. So I'm trying to find his podcasts. And that's not cool when you can't find your friend's podcast. What kind of friends lose their friend's podcast? And then the elephant in the room, <laughs> I've got a memo of understanding that I have to sign that's going to cost me a minimum of 15 grand. I got to sign that thing. And I Ooh, that's a down arrow. But then Christina Vimbach says, I want to move forward as a client. And I say, cool. And I said, I got to find the Hummer title for my, my Hummer because my Hummer <laughs> blew up. That's a down arrow. <laughs> then Boom Mobile bought some books and I got to charge them. That's cool. And then I got to read and sign a letter of understanding. I don't even know what that is yet. Then um, Esther, my good friend and, and hopefully a future literary agent, the lady who represents Tim Tebow is coming to Tulsa and I got to give her the itinerary. And then Charles Kola wants to know, how come I don't have a five-star schema on my website because I want to get and then patio galaxy wants me to read an agreement and dr edwards wants the neo 40 document you're in the military i'm sure you have an you have a, a, a great affection for acronyms and abbreviations but it's the neo 40 <laughs> i don't even know what that is uh, and then bob healy wants me to hear his podcast and rob turnout turns out he's not dead and he wrote the book titan so i want to book him on the podcast <laughs> then i wrote an article about lady liberty and it turns out it sucks so i got to edit it um but then i got to finish editing <laughs> sales domination you know um, and then I want to finish watching the sermon from Pastor Chad. And, and, and I'm just reading off my list. And then I will go back to the top of my list. This is where I never look, but it's at the top. Mm -hmm. And we have 155 clients that I support that do almost $3 billion of business, Mark. And there's a lot of pressure when you think about 155 businesses that on, on average employ 100, empl on, on average employ or, or are responsible for 100 people. So you start going, 155? times 100 and you start to get overwhelmed now right because that's, that's a bad thought and then i start to wonder i do it all the time if i th if i think about it my dad died of lou gehrig's three years ago why and i could spend my whole day ruminating on that and over time it would become lamenting and then i get a little man tear and then i go gotta go to work so there's a difference between you know lamenting and meditating correct i mean there's a difference between thinking because my list as i just shared it with you there's some really good things on this list today tim tebow's agent if she represents okay. us that's not bad that's good baby getting paid that's cool mediation not so good that wasn't good my dad dying that wasn't cool uh you know uh the mm. dr whitlock being booked out that's cool can't find Corey's podcast not cool i mean there's all these things that are <laughs> up and down can you can you tell us the difference between lamenting about a bad thing 
in marinating and, and maybe meditating about in a thoughtful way, planning out your day? Because if you do it right, you said it was almost funny to you watching these people yell at you while you were training for the SEALs. And that's how my day is now. It's almost right. funny now. It's almost funny. But tell us about the difference between lamenting and meditating. Meditating is content less. What you just described is all about the content. Meditation um, allows or prepares your mind to be able to examine the content and make m much quicker and more precise and cl clarified decisions about what to do and what not to do, what to focus on, what not to focus on. So the way this works for me or has over, or, you know, and, and, and also, by the way, it's not a quick thing. It's like, you, you know, you don't just decide to meditate and then, yeah. have like a, uh, you know, enlightened mind in 30 days, right? It, it takes a long time, but it doesn't have to be hard, you know? Yeah. It it's actually becomes quite joyful. So the process of meditation that I was describing earlier is yeah. content less. You're actually trying to get away from the content and really razor focus your mind. And then you begin to uh, shift, right, your perspective from being identified with your thoughts and being like, I am the thinker, I am Mark and I'm thinking, and I've got to think about this and I've got to think about that. And, yeah. and if this goes wrong, I'm bad. And if that goes right, I'm good. Yep. Whereas then the meditative process begins to shift you into this um, more metacognition, which is like separating your mental hard drive where now you're able to think more clearly about the quality of your thinking and the content. And then, and this is where it gets a little bit even more, um, exciting, you begin to shift into more pure awareness where you're aware of everything that's going on around and inside of you, but you're not caught up in it. You're not grabbed by it. Yes. So you become really not attached to the outcomes. This is where, you know, you can actually be a billionaire and not give a crap and give all your money away if you want to, because you're not attached to it. There it is. And so you want to have the ultimate in emotional development, begin to develop that level of detachment where you can be looking at moment to moment, like everything slows down. This is the ultimate flow state. You can see your thoughts and emotions arising. You can make a near, a real term, real time decision about whether you even want that in your conscious awareness. And you can literally nip it in the bud, so to speak, any kind of thought or emotion that's not going to serve you. And uh, so now when you, when you start to develop your mind like that, now you want to come back and, and start to examine content. The way I look at this is in the morning, and you did this, you described it very well. In the morning, you're going to look at your day, and I call this winning in your mind before you step foot in the battlefield yeah. of your day. You're going to look at what is my purpose on this planet? What is my mission aligned with that purpose? What am I doing today that's going to move me closer to that mission? And that mission can have several components, like you described it, family, faith, you know, business, yeah. et cetera, yeah. health. And then you're going to get really clear about what's the major lever that you can pull that's going to move the dial in the positive direction so you can get your mission accomplished. And I'm still not talking about all the miscellaneous tasks. That's yeah. just stuff. That's filler. Can I ask right? you this, can I ask like you this real quick? Say, I want to big rock. Take care of the big rocks first, I, then you can fill the little rocks in. I want to ask you this real quick here. Um, what sure. you, when you're clearing your, because this, this is what I do, and I and, and you and I, I'm not going to argue about semantics. I think we have a lot of similarities. I listen to really sure. positive things. So like T.D. Jakes uh, is one of my favorite ministers. I listen to him before I plan my day. And T.D. is talking about how he's he recently, he's re I, think he, I think recently T.D. Jakes has figured out that he's not young mm -hmm. anymore. And so he was doing a talk at Pastor <laughs> Stephen Furtick's church explaining that even when he dies, he gains. And he's gotten to a place in his life where he's resolved in his mind. He's got less days ahead than, you know, at a certain point in your life, you're looking towards the future. Now you're kind of looking towards how do I want to sure. finish? How do I want to finish this thing? Right. You know, and when I listen to something like that, and it's filled with a lot of stories that maybe aren't the most positive and some are, but it, it, I, it kind of retrains my brain. Because when I set my alarm for 2.30 in the morning and it goes off there or 3, I got to be honest with you, Mark. I'm pissed. I'm always That's thinking, tough. who set that thing? And then I realized I did. And then I <laughs> right. hit TD Jakes and I listen to it while I'm taking a shower. And then my mind is emptied for me. This is how it works for me. It's emptied and I'm no longer feeling pissed because I get so much right. more rejection 
then yes. And that negative bias, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you know what I mean? It's like you get so many more rejections right. than yeses. I mean, how do you clear your cranium? I just want to know a step. Just give us one more little tip. I know there's somebody out there that they're getting rejected so much. They're always pissed. Help somebody get unpissed. So, you, you know, you're using kind of an external source for positive mental development to, yes. this, to replace what naturally arises, you know, that negativity. You get shocked awake at three in the morning. You don't want to get up and immediately your brain clicks into fight or flight mode, even yeah. though it's not really at risk, right? There's, there's no tiger going to eat you, but yeah. you just have to get up well before your, you know, your body mind wants you to get up. So listening to that is like, an, it's like, you know, some people find, you know, a really good meditation tape or, uh, you know, or, or um, app or, you know, you listen to your pastor or some people yep. listen to really nice music. I um, have learned to develop an internal uh, mantra, an internal set of dialogues. So when I mm. wake up, even if it's super early, I immediately start that breathing practice that I talked about, which begins to get my body into balance and it, it kind of reorganizes my brain after whatever maybe dreams or whatever night's sleep I had. And then I, I insert in my own mind a set of dialogues, you know, a, some statements and some running uh, dialogue that I have, which I've curated, which also mean something to me, which have the same effect. And, um, and so the, the, the feeling is one of gratitude uh, one of self love or self care. Yeah. One of um, daily, daily improvement. You know, my overarching themes in life are to master myself every day so I can serve others in my unique way. Right. So that actually could be a mantra, even though it's not one of mine. Can you share your mantras, mantras or you're not allowed like, to share? Can you share well, a mantra? Are you allowed to, or is that a secret thing, private thing? No, there's no secret thing at all. The word mantra just means like internal saying. Right. Gotcha. And I know there's there's some people who follow this guy named Maharaji, what's his name, <laughs> who, who has, who's the founder of Transcendental Meditation. And TM mm -hmm. is simply a concentration practice using a mantra, uh, an internal saying, an internal sound, which is, you know, is form, formed in a word, but it might be a word that's not familiar to, let's say, a, an English-speaking Westerner. It might be something in Sanskrit, but it can easily be an English word. And I've learned, through all my, you know, it's actually better to have a, a word or a series of words that you know what they mean yeah. And you can attach even more emotional power to them. So when I started doing this uh, in preparation for the SEALs and I got the SEAL training, my mantra was, I'm feeling good, I'm looking good, I ought to be in Hollywood. And I oh. would, to this day, that starts playing when I you know, wake up in the morning. Well, I'll tell you that's feeling true. Good, I'm looking it's good, I ought to be in Hollywood. Nothing's more true feeling than good, that I'm statement. Good, I ought to be in Hollywood. <laughs> you're look, you are looking good right there. Yeah, you, when you got out of the, thank you, thank you. When you got out of the, the, the SEALs, why did you decide not just, you know, take a military retirement and, and hang out? I mean, what, what inspired you to write this new book, Staring Down the Wolf, the, the seven leadership commitments that forge elite teams? Well, it's a great question. I got off active duty in 1996, and my, my military career was half active duty and half reserves. So 20 years, I retired as a commander, uh, Navy SEAL commander in 2011. But I, as a reserve officer, as you know, I was uh, able to spend some time in the civilian world, more time than in the military. So about 60 days a year, I was in uniform. And then for two of those 10 years, uh, my, my reserve time, I was called hmm. up for a full year and I went to combat and those types of things. So that was like no different than active duty. I didn't have any time to do anything but that. But the rest of the time for those eight years, I could be an entrepreneur. And so I... I launched my first business, which is called the Coronado Brewing Company, a microbrewery restaurant in San Diego. Coronado? And, um, yeah, in Coronado. Were you on the on Coronado Island? Launch? Were you on Coronado Island? I was, and that's where the SEALs training base is. And when I brother. got off of duty, I married oh, a Coronado girl. And then, brother, my wife's from I, San Diego. I, I love that. The there. I, I, my wife's from San Diego, and I love Coronado. The, 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 what is the, the Dell Hotel? I have stayed there many times. Yeah, the mm -hmm. ho Hotel Dell. Oh, you're getting yeah, me fired up. Place. Well, you're getting me fired up right now. So what was your first business again now? You started on Coronado? It was called the Coronado Brewing Company, a okay. microbrewery restaurant. It's still there. It's thriving. You know, it's like really, really successful. Cool. I launched that with my brother-in-law. And then uh, three, you know, two years, two years later, um, I, I ended up in this kind of like, you know, wrestling match with 
he and his brother who he had brought in. And it didn't turn out well. I tell that story in Staring Down the Wolf. That was my first business venture where I tried to use like Navy SEAL leadership tactics. Hmm. And some of them worked and some of them didn't. And so then I went off and, and one of the major f- failures in that was I never really took the time to build the team the way that the SEALs built my team for me before I could take over. So I recognize that most organizations, you know, don't have the benefit of a homogeneous workforce like the military with a two year selection and, you know, a session training that is extremely arduous so that only the best people end up on your team. And I took a lot of that for granted. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of my teammates who write these leadership books, they don't get that in the civilian world, you don't, you don't have that. You don't have right. that team at your right. back as a prima uh. facie facia thing. It's really, really hard to work in the civilian world because you got people coming from all different walks of life, so true. From all different sets of skills, different levels of development, different perspectives. And as a leader to come in and try to lead them with just like a, a rod and a stick or one, one way is my, you know, my way or the highway, it just doesn't work. You just leave all this energy on the table because your team doesn't trust or respect you. So it took me almost, um, gosh, you know, I, I, I've started like six different businesses. And finally, in the last two, I was able to pull it all together and build what I call an elite team in the civilian world that is really firing in all cylinders. And, and we have just an incredible time and we're all growing together and we love coming to work and we're, we're having a big impact. And I wanted to share that story, not necessarily saying this is how you do it because I was a Navy SEAL leader and we kicked ass and we, you know, we won every mission in the SEALs, but more of, hey, this is what didn't work. This is where I fell on my face. And these are the, what I call seven commitments that you can commit to, to train yourself as a leader and your team every day while at work and while you're at home so that you guys can unlock massive potential. And that commitments are courage, commitment to courage of the daily practice, commitment to trust. That's the second one. Commitment to respect, mm-hmm. commitment to growth. So you're all growing together, both vertically and horizontally. And I could explain that in a minute. A commitment to excellence in the small details. Like when you have a practice, I can tell of excellence where every day you're asking, what did I learn? How can I do better? You know, where should I focus the preponderance of my time? You know, those are, practices of excellence. So a commitment to that, a commitment to resiliency. This is a biggie, right? No plan survives contact with any day, right? So expect things to fail, develop an attitude where failure is expected, be ready for it and learn how to become a learning machine Mm. from falling on your face and blooding your nose day in and day out, because it's going to happen. And you know, It's getting more and more, you know, we use the term VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous in the military. Well, the business world, I think, is pretty darn VUCA right now. So be ready for failure and get comfortable with it. That's resiliency. Pick yourself up, dust yourself off, put a smile on, learn from it, and move forward. Doubt is eliminated by action alone. And then the last commitment is alignment. This one's money. Like having a communication strategy that almost over communicates your vision, your mission, the boundaries for behavior, those things that define the culture and just get radically um, focused on improving every single day. And you do that through communication, asking together as a team, what went well, what didn't go well, how can we do it better next time? So you have a, a brief and a debrief, and always striving for improvement and always staying in alignment. So everyone's clear about what the mission is. And so you can have, you know, almost semi-autonomous operations where everyone can make a decision that they know is going to be in alignment with the team because you're all, you understand what the implied and the explicit, um, you know, objectives are of the team. What does your new business so do that, for the people the out there? Commitment. What are the people, what does your business do uh, for the people out there who are curious what you do now? What, what, what does your company do? So the company is called, I have one of my books is called Unbeatable Mind. Okay. And that was basically, you know, to, to teach these, you know, internal practices and yeah. teach this kind of lifestyle. So um, I started to get a lot of leaders and teams who were asking me for, you know, to come out and train their, their um, train them. And so we began to combine 
let me back up and say I had a my first or the second business I had was called SealFit. SealFit is like hardcore physical mental training for spec ops candidates and then a, a lot of elite athletes. So I started to, to take some of these things that were really effective with the SEAL candidates in terms of training them to be good teammates and you know better leaders under fire yeah. and bring them to the corporate world. And so that now Unbeatable basically does leadership development and team training where we, you know, where we get people together to develop and commit to these seven commitments. And we, and we test them under pressure using, you know, um, some of the techniques that I use in seal fit and others that we've evolved where it has a real, you know, kind of hard and soft um, aspect to it. It's really embodied leadership development. Everybody can do it. Some people look at it and say, Oh my God, it seems kind of hard. I see people out there in the ocean and I see people sitting in the ice bath. And I said, yeah, that, but also look over here. You see people sitting and learning how to do breath training and mindfulness and learning how to concentrate and all these work together so that you unlock more potential and then you can perform better under pressure. Hmm. And look, Oh, by the way, there's women, old, young, there's men, all sorts of fitness levels. So, you know, in order to grow, you've got to basically challenge yourself in order to challenge yourself. You got to get uncomfortable with being uncomfortable. So we're going to take you uh, leader and team, and we're going to put you in scenarios and situations that are going to make you really uncomfortable mm. and take you uh, places that you haven't gone before. Because most people, they don't, they're, they don't do that on their own, right? They you tend to stay in that comfort zone and kind of do the same things day in and day out and expect different results. So we take people out of their comfort zones, teach them to think and uh, teach them how to think emotionally and connect to their heart and to do it under pressure in, in environments that are, you know, awkward for them. And then we, um, when they go back to the office, their paradigm has shifted, right? They have a whole new perspective on what hard is. They have a new perspective on what they're capable of and as well as what their teammates are capable of. And everybody is much more aligned and connected as a teammate. And that's when, you know, the results really start to, to show up for them. Mark, I, I totally want to uh, respect your time, but I have three final questions here for you. The first, though, will be, uh, will be thrown at you from Josh Wilson. Now, now, Josh Wilson started a company called Living Water Irrigation, and he's grown the company from $300,000 of revenue now to $1.9 million. And just the past couple of years, he's been a client of mine for a long time. Uh, as a military background, am I right, Josh? You have yes, a military sir. background. Where, where did you serve? The Air Force. The Air Force. Okay, so you... Uh, can ask Mark any question you want, and if he doesn't like it, he'll just hang up. So Sweet. what do you got? Well, he was a Navy SEAL, and I was, in, I was a Chair Force <laughs> guy, so it's okay. a little bit of a different service level. So uh, first and foremost, thank you and uh, commitment, your commitment to service first to our country and then what you're doing now, Mark. It's absolutely awesome. So I want to go back. Uh, obviously, military guys, commitment to excellence and excellence is all we do and the integrity and all that stuff. It's a lot simpler for us, I think. But I want to go back to our the, the start of your talk here about – most people quit because of a m emotional or mental reasons. Yes. So not our listeners, but other people's yeah, listeners. Other people's listeners. I know that they lack discipline. <laughs> I know that they lack diligence. Not I know people. that they they wake up and, and, and the sun's not shining and it's raining, so they don't want to go to yeah, work go or, to or they have the bed. sniffles yeah. or they – they didn't close the or deal that they wanted about to close. Maybe having the sniffles. Oh yeah, they don't even have it. It's phantom sniffles. Yeah, they're worried. Like, other people in the office have. It could sniffles. happen someday. It's their birthday. Right. Right. So, <laughs> what I want to talk about is how do you begin for those other people out yeah, there, other people that don't have discipline, that don't have the diligence, that don't have the commitment to excellence. How do you begin to teach those people to resolve, regardless mm. of how you feel, or regardless of how your emotions are? Or whether or not it's a win or a loss, I loved how Clay shared his to-do list because you got wins and losses all day, every day, all day, every. And day. and I loved how you mentioned there, and I think a lot of people didn't see that, but everybody has a plan until you hit contact, and maybe you can unpack what that means mm -hmm. for those people who don't understand military stuff. But how do you go about resolving and having the discipline, regardless of how you mentally feel that day or how you emotionally feel at any given point? Yeah, Josh, good, great questions, uh, and also thank you for your service as well. I love the Air Force. I got, we've, we've put a lot of people into the pararescue training, and actually the pararescue pipeline is using some of the Unbeal Mind uh, training protocols, you know, the mental training protocols. So it's really cool to see that collaboration between the Navy and the Air Force. The um, first, you know, no plan survives contact. You know, we wake up every day and we have this perfect plan, and we step outside and 
it, it's almost immediately, or we step in the office almost immediately thrown out the window. So does that mean we don't plan? No, we plan as best we can, but we don't obsess on the plan. The plan is a suggestion. It's a, it's a, it's an arrow that's pointing in a particular direction. Now, the better we get at planning, the more contingency plans we'll have in our plan, which means that there's a number of ways that we can get this done. We acknowledge it. We have our primary, we have our secondary, we got our tertiary. And even then, if all three of those fail or are inaccessible to us, we'll find a mayor way or make a way. So that's part skill of actual planning really rapidly, knowing what to, you know, what to focus your time on, which are those critical nodes that, you know, things go south there, then the whole thing is a show versus the things that are more standard operating procedure. Well, you, you train the standard operating procedure so you can do it in your sleep. You focus your planning on the critical nodes and you have contingency plans for those critical nodes. In your parlance, it'd be like, like, you know, the insertion and the extraction of the aircraft, right? Getting the guys in the field and out of the field. Well, if the aircraft goes down, bad things happen, right? You know, um, if, you, if you put the operators in the wrong place, bad things happen. If you put the bombs on the wrong building, bad things happen. So you have to have contingency plans for all that. So part of the thinking is to learn how to think well, to make better rapid plans so that mm. your plans this is good. meet the real world, you know, with more fidelity, meaning, meaning like you have fewer and fewer failures as you move forward. So the best teams are really good rapid planners and it's because they have multiple plans couched within their overarching plan. And then they visualize those plans and they practice those plans. We call those dirt dives in the field. So that you've done them before multiple times before you ever step foot in the battlefield. Now, back to your original question, that is one way to eliminate doubt. But in the, in the military, you know, that's kind of handed to us on a platter. You remember that, Josh? When you showed up and someone said, hey, Josh, go go build, build our operational plan for this next mission, you would have been like deer in the headlights. But you didn't have to do that. You had, you know, a whole team there, and they knew how to do it, and you were taken under someone's wing as the whatever intel guy or, or the junior officer, and you learned slowly how to do that until, you know, several years later you were running the, the planning and then conducting the missions. So you had this crawl, walk, run approach to how you learn things. And this is what we teach our, our leaders. Like, you're not going to, you know, suddenly become a master meditator, a master planner, mm. you got to basically take the crawl, walk, run approach. So start with one action that is going to improve the way you think every day. And I mentioned earlier, this practice we call box breathing. That's the action that ultimately will build the foundation upon which you'll be able to think better. You'll be able to uh, manage your emotions better and you'll be able to um, rapid plan better because it's slowing everything down. It's basically a flow activator. You slow down your mind, you get it into that alpha, you know, high alpha, low beta state, which is your very creative kind of spontaneous, intuitive state. And then you, on top of that, you layer some other uh, mental models that are going to be able to avoid bias and distraction and uh, negative reactionary conditioning. And so you, then you introduce that and you train those one at a time until suddenly what's happened is you've got this set of tools that you've been training with mm. that have completely and radically altered the way that you uh, think and the way you approach a problem. And you become really good at solving problems really quickly because you can declutter the battlefield. You can focus in on the right things at the right time. You've got contingency plans for when things go wrong. You've made like uncommon thinking standard operating procedure. Now, for all of that to work, you know, the listeners are saying, wow, that sounds really cool. Where do I start? Well, everything, everything, as you know, just and it starts with a commitment, right? A commitment, not necessarily to learn something, but to grow. Yeah. And so this is kind of like the difference between learning new skills and tactics and learning how to grow. And the more growth that you can uh, unlock in yourself, the more effective all those strategies and tactics that you learn as a leader, will you'll be, you'll be at delivering those or bringing those to bear. Those are just tools or arrows in your quiver, right? So leaders, to me, I think the next frontier for leadership development is what I call vertical development. I used that term earlier. 
vertical development is the type of development that changes your character. It grow, you grow from it, meaning you grow greater perspective, greater compassion, greater ability to connect and to be in tune with your teammates. Um, you know, grow, that growth has a physical, mental, emotional, intuitional, and spiritual component to it. And I use that spiritual word in a non-religious sense. When I use that term spiritual, what I mean is it's a great knowingness about why you're on this planet and what you're meant to do about it and a firm commitment to stay in alignment with that and never get pushed off and to take bold action, you know, around those things that are really important to you. And, it, and that is different for every human being, right? What makes you, Josh, is different than what makes me, Mark, which is different than what makes Clay Clay. That's your spiritual center or your kind of like your uniqueness as a human being. So all of those, when we grow, all of those get more refined, the physical, mental, emotional, intuitional, and spiritual, and they begin to integrate. So they're experienced as one whole thing as, a bunch, as opposed to a bunch of separate things. And that's what we call whole mind. When you begin to access whole mind, now you're getting to a much more rarefied state of decision-making and, and thinking where there's a lot of spontaneity. And I think that's like when people say, I want to learn how to be more intuitive or, or intuitive leadership is really mm -hmm. important. Yes. Well, how do you train it? You train it through accessing whole mind thinking. It's a big part of what we try to teach our leaders. So that was a long winded answer to your question, but first comes the commitment to grow and then you learn the skills that are going to make you more effective day in and day out. That's awesome, Mark. Thank Mark, the, 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 the title of your book is called Staring Down the Wolf. Seven Leadership Commitments That Forge Elite Teams. So, Mark, I'm going I'm to stare down the wolf before Josh went up to me with the final question. I'm going to stare down the wolf. I'm, I'm staring at you over the, over the audio here, just over the audio waves, over the great ether. I'm staring <laughs> you down. I feel it. And I have, I have seven leadership commitments that I was going to make for the, for the Thrive Nation here. Because rumor has it, you know Gabby Reese. You've interviewed Gabby Reese. And so this is what I, I'm – these, these are my seven what a commitments. Great person. I love her. These are my seven commitments. One, ask Mark to tell Gabby Reese we're not an idiot and we, he, she should be on our show. Uh, commitment two, ask Mark to tell <laughs> Gabby to be on our show. Commitment three, ask – so anyway – you get the flow. So at some point, if you run into Gabby, you know, just kind of say, hey, the Thrive Time Nation wants to have you on the show because she is a, a great uh, a fitness expert, a championship volleyball player, and she's been on your show. Tell us about your show. Yeah, Gabby has been on my show. She was a blast. In fact, I went up to see her and Laird Hamilton at their place in Malibu, and I got to do some training with them in their pool doing like, you know, like it was fun for me taking the dumbbells underwater and, you know, hand over hand crawling like an alligator from one end of the pool to the to, to back again. And I loved it. They were looking at me going like, wow, this, you're a natural. This. I said, well, I am a Navy SEAL, right? We're supposed to be able to do this stuff. Most of their yeah, athletes that's right. can't do this stuff. They're fun. <laughs> but Gabby is great. And so we have, you know, my show is called the Unbeatable Mind Podcast. As I you know, mentioned earlier, that's the name of my second book. Mm. It's my self-published book. I'm about ready. I'm actually working on another update. And I love that about self-publishing a book because you can play with it, right? You're never done with it. You know, you keep on changing if you want. So I've been updating this one. This is my, this be essentially the fourth edition. It's kind of like my philosophy for living. And I go into the training that we've talked about here. Now the podcast is where then I get to stop being the expert and I get to interview other experts. So I have experts from the field of sports psychology and uh, mindfulness and Zen meditation. I have you know, great thought leaders coming on from all different, you know, spiritual traditions, because that's interesting to me, physical studs from like CrossFit Games uh, champions and martial arts masters. It's really interesting. I just can go broad because I really focus on experts in those areas that I call those five mountains of physical, physical mastery, mental mastery, emotional mastery, intuitive mastery, and then this, you know, spiritual mastery as I defined it earlier, which is not really, you know, from a, a religious point of view, although that's not off the table at all. But, you know, I think they can go hand in glove. But as you guys know, it can get a little bit tricky sometimes yeah. to navigate that one. Well, you've interviewed uh, Rob Wolf, <laughs> too. One of my clients is obsessed with, with Rob Wolf, the, the food and nutrition uh, expert there. Rob uh, Dawson. You've had, yeah, you, you yeah. had some great guests. Are a lot of these folks from San Diego? Do you find you interview, do you interview a lot of the folks that, from the area? You, 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 you no, no. International in scope. I mean, mostly yeah, U.S., yeah. but I've had all sorts of international. Most of my shows are 
a remote like this. Yeah. I use, you know, Zencaster or Skype. I love to do them in person. You know, one of my aspirations is someday to have a, you know, a show where all the shows are in person. I Like I did with Gabby Reese, I get to train and or do whatever they do. I get to know their world a little bit better. But yeah. that takes, you know, I'm running uh, two businesses and I'm always writing and speaking. So it's really hard. Podcasting is a lot of work. It is. If you're going to take it seriously, it's a lot of work, as you know. So, uh, you know, to do them in person is almost like a full time thing. Yeah, I mean, there's big so, guests though for the folks out there that are for the folks out there who are curious. I mean, you have some big guests. I mean, Ryan Holiday's been on your show. Uh, Guy Kawasaki's been on your right. show. I mean, you've really been at it. How many episodes do you think you have out at this point? Seven or seventy or seven thousand? How many? <laughs> we're at like two fifty. Yeah, but we have a good following, and we're hidden. We're we're close to. 20 million downloads. We get about 300,000 people a month listening. And yep. so it started, we have, you know, 1500 five-star reviews. So, you know, we definitely have some momentum, let's put it that way. So yeah. it's taking more and more of my energy because it's actually having an impact. A lot of people are finding our work through the podcast. And it's funny because it literally started on a challenge. My team challenged me. said, Mark, you need a podcast. I'm like, what else do you want to layer onto my life? You know? And I was kind of, for the first year or two, I didn't really take it seriously. And then it started taking off. I'm like, wow, this is interesting, you know? I better pay attention to this little thing I got over here. Hey, David Goggins has been on your show. So many great guests. I encourage everybody to check out your podcast by going to unbeatablemind.com. It's unbeatablemind.com, and you click on the podcast button, and there you can hear the podcast. Josh Wilson, we have time for one more rapid-fire question. This will be a hot one, a quick 30-second, like a see if you can really trick him with a tough question. <laughs> okay, so Mark, so how would you, uh, and, and for anybody out in their safe space out there, whatever, I don't hope we don't lose a whole bunch of listeners that we don't need anyway, but um, how do you, in a <laughs> civilian world, how do you tell somebody to suck it up and press on? How do, how do you say that without saying it that you know, way? What would you advise to that military I leader out there? To, I literally use this term, embrace the suck. Awesome. So, and it's not said in a derogatory way, but, you know, Hey, especially if, if you're going to train with me, if you're going to strive to improve yourself every day, stand by. It's not going to be easy. You're going to have to embrace the suck of that work. It's, that's why we call it work. But guess what? On the other side of that comes great enjoyment at the progress you're making, great peace of mind knowing that you're getting stronger, better, faster, smarter, more clear, making better decisions every day. The, the, opposite of that is to do nothing and if you do nothing then the law of entropy says that you're going to slide backwards and you're going to end up getting weaker every day and you're going to make worse decisions and you're going to get unhealthier and guess what that's not necessary right we don't want to go there so embrace the suck make the hard easy you know do the uncommon things until they're until you can do them uncommonly well and uh you know Show up every day and be different. Be special. Mark, I, I, I appreciate you so much for taking the time out of out of your schedule to be here with us. I thank you for, for serving our country. I thank you for rounding up some really great folks and putting them on your podcast. And I really do appreciate you for writing yeah. this new book because I think everybody out there, if you've ever struggled to lead a, a team, a crack squad of American employees that are not Navy SEALs, you know what I mean? <laughs> if you've ever tried, right? sometimes you might have – on your team, Batman, you might have Beavis, you might have Butthead, you might have a whole <laughs> cast of characters because it's the average American employee. If you want to take a team of people and forge it into an elite team without the military might and, and having an elite team of SEALs you're leading, this book is a practical, tactical, strategic guide to help you forge an elite team. Uh, check it out today. Buy the book today. Again, the book is called Staring Down the Wolf. Seven Leadership Commitments That Forge Elite Teams. Again, that's Staring Down the Wolf, Seven Leadership Commitments That Forge Elite Teams. Thanks so much, Clay. The book is Staring, Staring Down the Wolf, subtitle Seven Leadership Commitments That Forge Elite Teams. StaringDownTheWolf.com, by the way, we have a free several-hour leadership training for anyone who wants to participate in that. Go to the, find out more about that on StaringDownTheWolf.com. Staring so appreciate down the you guys for having me on the show. Staringdownthewolf.com, right? So staringdownthewall.com. Check it out. Hope you have a great rest of your day, sir. Staring down the wolf. All right, you as well. Take care now. And now, without any further ado, three, two, one, boom! Why?
does this still keep happening to me? I don't know whose prayer I'm breaking into, but I'm breaking into somebody's prayer saying, Lord, why do I keep going through the same things over and over again? And the Lord sent me here to tell you the problem is with your default. Until you change your default, you will always go back to being who you were before because you have never changed your mind. You change your friends, you change your address, you change your phone number, you change the songs you sing, you change everything else, but you didn't change your mind. There is nothing as powerful as a change of mind. Boom! Nothing is powerful as a change mind. Boom! Better get yours, cause I'ma take mine. Boom! Leave them where they got if they ain't ready. Used to have a lot of homies, now they dropping like a belly. I'm like, boom! We taking over, it's our time now. Boom! Oh, you ain't know, we about to thrive now. Big, overwhelming, optimistic, holding middle, eight place. Hey! Back, let me get them. Don't get them then. Hurdle every obstacle, trying to do the impossible. Turn my whole life around, hey, let's thought it was comical. Had to make some moves, didn't need to seem logical. Quarterback to play, man, I had to call it audible. Drop back, stop that. Rearrange and switch it up. Only got one life to live. It's best that you go live it up. Vega ain't an option. Ain't no way that I can give it up. <laughs> hey, knowledge, go pick it up. Nothing like your posse. Look poppy. You cannot top me. They watch me and try to copy like Rocky. You cannot stop me. Holier than never. We grinding all through the weather. We shining because we better get with us. We bout to chatter. Once I change my mind, dog, trust me. Ain't no going back. Coming for that top spot. I'm feeling like they owe me that. Time for us to level up. I feel like we've been holding back. Throw your hands up. Say it with me if you know it, Dad. Boom. Nothing is powerful as a change. Mind. Boom, better get yours, cause I'ma take mine. Boom, leave them where they got if they ain't ready. Used to have a lot of homies, now they dropping like a belly. I'm like, boom, we taking over, it's our time now. Boom, oh, you ain't know, we about to thrive now. Big, overwhelming, optimistic, no little eight hey, clay. Hey, back, let me get them. Yeah, came a long way from where I used to be. I used to call, leave the seat like the way I used to sleep. Cold habits die hard, but you gotta leave them. Man. If they ain't riding like a Harley, then you don't need them. You're cheering and you're clapping, I don't need that. Fake friends treat them like fat Joe, make them lean back. Sight with no vision, make you blind, I can see that. Anything I think up in my mind, I can achieve that. Whoa. I can make a million if I want to. I'ma keep it real, cause I want to. Other women try to holler, girl, I won't show. And disrespecting wife is what I won't do. Go on, do your dance, go on, do your dance. If you really wanna change, gotta have a plan. Even when they sit down, I'ma take a stand. Throw your hands up, say it with me, you be know it, man. But these become your thoughts. thoughts become your actions, Whoa. so be intentional about where your passion Whoa. is focused, there's no hocus focus. focus, we only live once man, and you know this, you can't press the rewind, but you can make a beeline, to the next level like you're headed for the tree line, I was born in Minnesota, moved to Oklahoma, incorporated both into my rhymes, now it's time to show ya, how a former stuttering student can turn out the raps, with a lyrical miracle flow in the cash to match, yeah I'm important, a Minnesota refugee, but I'm consistent as can be, as I rap on hip hop beats, bringing rappers and tax, even though that I'm wise, I can play that folk music, but I ain't vanilla ice. Here we go, here we go, here we go, full scream. Three, two, one, dynamite on the scene. Boom. Nothing is powerful as a change mind. Boom. Better get yours, cause I'ma take mine. Boom. Leave them where they got if they ain't ready. Used to have a lot of homies, now they dropping like a belly. I'm like, boom. We taking over, it's our time now. Boom. Oh, you ain't know, we about to thrive now. Big, overwhelming, optimistic, momentum. Boom. And the Lord sent me here to tell you the problem is with your default. Until you change your default, you will always go back to being who you were before because you have never changed your mind. You change your friends, you change your address, you change your phone number, you change the songs you sing, you change everything else, but you didn't change your mind, there is nothing as powerful as a changed mind. Hear the rest of T.D. Jakes' incredible, life-changing and mind-altering sermon. Nothing as powerful as a changed mind today. By looking up T.D. Jakes on YouTube and typing in, nothing as powerful as a changed mind. That is a Biblical Miracle Rap 